Good morning. Well, maybe afternoon, might be evening. Pre-calculus students at Rancho Verde. And I am your host on this wonderful journey of pre-calculus, Mr. Langston. And we are going to have section 1-4, which is functions. Now, the first thing from my lesson that I did, of course, is my warm-up. So I got my first warm-up up here. Well, not my first warm-up, but the warm-up. First thing you're going to do up here. And you need to find the equation of the line that is parallel to the line of y equals, or sorry, not y equals, 4x minus 2y equals 3 and goes through the point of 2, 1. So what you need to do is remember what I taught you guys about slopes of parallel lines. The slopes of parallel lines are exactly the same. So we've got this line here. I need to find its slope. And that's going to be the slope of the other line, which is parallel to the one I just circled. So I've got 4x minus 2y equals 3. I need to get y all by itself because I need to get it into slope-intercept form, which is y equals mx plus b. So I got 4x minus 2y equals 3. I'm going to take and subtract 4x from both sides, minus 4x, minus 4x. And what I've got here is... And I'll actually put that in a different color because I kind of want to keep colors going. So I've got negative 2y equals, yeah, I'm messing up today, 3 minus 4x. Now, I don't like 3 minus 4x because I like having the x first. I like having the x mx plus b. So I'm going to reverse that. Instead of saying 3 minus 4x, I'm going to say negative 4x plus 3. And I barely gave myself enough room. Man, really? So I'm going to rewrite it up here. I've got negative 2y equals negative 4x plus 3. And now I'm going to take and I'm going to divide both sides by negative 2. So divide by negative 2, divide by negative 2, divide by negative 2. And what I've got is y equals, because these cancel out, and these two I can divide. So the negatives cancel. Let's get rid of those. The 4 divided by 2, well, that's going to be 2. So I got 2x, and now I have minus 3 over 2. This is not the equation of the line that's parallel. This is actually the equation of the line. I need to find the line that's parallel that goes through point 0.21. So I've got the equation in slope-intercept form of this line. The reason I did that is because I need to find its slope. And I've got its slope right here. It's 2. So now I have... I know my slope is 2, and I've got a point 0.21. So what I do is I go to my point-slope form. Point-slope form is y minus y1 equals m x minus x1. And I'm going to plug into point-slope form. I've got my point. Let's label my point. So I've got x1, y1. And I'm going to plug into my point slope form. m is 2, x1 is 2, y1 is 1. So I have y minus 1 equals 2, x minus 2. Let's take and distribute that 2 into the parentheses. So when I do that, I have y minus 1 is equal to 2x minus 4. And now I'm going to take and I'm going to add 1 to both sides, plus 1, plus 1. And when I do, and I'm going to write my equation over here. I barely gave myself enough room. So when I do that, these ones cancel out. I'm left with y by itself, and that's equal to 2x and negative 4 plus 1 
minus three. That's my answer, minus three. Now, if you plug this into Haiku Learning, because I do all my homework through Haiku Learning, so if you plug it into the computer, you're just going to plug y equals 2x minus 3. You're not going to use spaces. You don't have to put this 2 into parentheses. I only have you put it into parentheses when it's a fraction. Okay, so that gives me the next problem. And I'm going to erase just a little bit of this right here so I can make room. That way I'm not confusing anything. And that's a lie. So I need to find the equation that now is perpendicular to the same line and goes through this point, 2, 1. So I have my equation right here, right here, and that was a 2. My equation of the line, because this part, I basically, I, I have to solve this again to get it into a slope intercept form. Well, I already did that in the first part of the warm up. So I'm going to take this. This is my equation of this line here in slope intercept form. So I know that my line has a slope of two. What I need to do is get the perpendicular slope. What I taught you guys about the slopes of perpendicular lines is they are opposite reciprocals. So let's just make this into a fraction. I'll make it 2 over 1. The reciprocal of 2 over 1 is 1 half. And what I mean when I say opposite, when I say opposite reciprocals, is if this one's a positive, boom, that one's a negative. So my perpendicular slope is negative 1 half. And now, I've got my perpendicular slope. I don't need this anymore. So I've got this, very important, and I have my point. My point is 2, 1. That's my x1. This is my y1. And I plug it in to, say it with me, point, slope, form. So I've got y minus y1 equals m, x minus x1 and I plug it in plug it in from SC Johnson a family company so y minus 1 equals negative 1 half x minus 2 and now I distribute say it like a creeper <laughs> distribute so I distribute the negative one-half into the x, and I distribute the negative one-half into the negative two. So when I do, y minus one equals negative one-half x, negative times a negative. So I already did this one. Now I'm doing this one, negative one-half into negative two. Negative times a negative is a positive, and one-half times two, that's just going to cancel out, become one. Last thing I do, I add 1 to both sides because I want to get Y by itself. When I do, can you feel the spirit? Cancels out right there. Y equals negative 1 half X, 1 plus 1, plus 2. Now, when you plug this into your Haiku Learning account, you are going to plug in y equals, put it in parentheses because it's a fraction, negative one-half in the parentheses, x plus two. And there you go. That's your answer of your perpendicular line. So what we've got for this section, section 1-4, what is a function? So a function has a domain and a range, okay? And when I say a domain, I'm talking about, and it's right there, our x values. And when I say range, I'm talking about all my y values. Now, a function assigns each x value in the domain to exactly one y value. So what I'm saying is for every x value, let's say x is 1, 2, 3, 4. Let's say I have a function which has 
possible x values of 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. And I don't know why I did that little curve part. I didn't do so hot there. And I have my y values. And let's say I get y values of 1, 2, 4. For it to be a function, every x value goes to one y value. So let me actually undo that because I don't like that. I'm going to put it in a different color. Every x value goes to one y value. Now, it's OK for an x value to go to the same y value that another x value went to. For instance, look here. I've got 2 going to 2, and I've also got 4 going to 2. It's OK for that to happen. That's OK. It's still a function. But when I have an x value going to two different y values, then it's no longer a function. This is what I'm talking about. If I have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. These are my possible x values. And let's take my possible y values, 1, 2, and 4. When I have an x value going to two different y values, for instance, 2 in the x maps to 1, and it also maps to 2, now it is not a function. because it mapped to two different y values. It is OK for an x value to map to one y value only for it to be a function. And I can have two different x values going to the same y. I can have 2 going to 2 and 4 going to 2. That's OK. But what I can't have is an x value going to two different y values. So 2 going to 1 and 2 also going to 2. That's not OK. So that's pretty much that type of express or function. Yeah, that's pretty much it for functions, or as far as I can say, the definition and such like that of functions. What I want to also get into, how to evaluate a function. So first off, I want to talk about, before we get into this problem, what this means, g of x. For functions, we usually write them as f of x, g of x, h of x, OK? And what all this means is it's a fancy way of saying y. It's just a fancy way of saying y. So you're used to this. If I give you this, you don't have a problem. You're like y equals negative x squared plus 4x plus 1. You're all like, oh, OK, that's fine. No big deal, man. But then when I give you g of x, you're like, what? It's the same, dude. It's all the same. Don't sweat it. This is just a fancy way of saying y. Now, the cool thing about this is if I change this x into something else, what it means is wherever I see x, I plug in whatever I changed it to. So for instance, g of 2 means wherever I see x, I plug in 2. I just plug it in, plug it in from Essie Johnson, a family company. So let me just show you here without actually writing on here, OK? I'm going to change it to black, and I'm just going to write g of x. So I've got g of x. That's equal to negative x squared plus 4x plus 1. And now I take and I'm going to find g of 2. Well, that is negative 2 squared, quantity squared, actually plus 4 times 2 plus 1. And I just evaluate it. So g of 2, that's equal to negative 4 plus 8 plus 1. 
negative 4 plus 8. Negative 4 plus 8, that's going to be positive 4 plus 1. Positive 4 plus 1. G of 2 is equal to 5. Yay! And that's it. So now I'm really going to throw you off. I'm going to put G of T. Well, it follows the same premise. When I have G of 2, all I did is I plugged in 2 wherever I saw X. So G of T means plug in the letter T wherever I see X. So let me rewrite G of X because I don't know. I just do. Makes me feel like I'm doing something. So negative X squared plus 4X plus 1. And now I'm going to just plug in my T. G of T equals negative T squared plus 4 times T plus 1. There's nothing for me to simplify. That's it. I mean, I just plugged it in. Boom. There it is. It's over. It's done. Nothing else. It's that it. It's not fancy. It's nothing. So I'm going to rewrite G of X here. G of X equals negative X squared plus 4X plus 1. So now I'm going to do G of X plus 2. So G of X plus 2. And what this means is wherever I see X, I'm going to plug in X plus 2. So for instance, I see X here. So I'm going to plug in X plus 2. So that's equal to negative X plus 2, quantity squared, plus 4, I see X. So I plug in x plus 2, and now plus 1. So I'm going to evaluate that. Okay, I'm not going to rewrite the g of x plus 2 right now because I'm starting to run out of room, and I don't want to run, run out of room. Or wait. Hwa! Give us a little more room. There you go. Ooh, thank you. I've cleansed the diamond. So g of x plus 2, that's equal to, so we're going to do x plus 2 quantity squared. I'm not a fan of FOIL method. I don't like FOIL. I like a stacking method, okay? So the way I do that is x plus 2 quantity squared, that's x plus 2 times x plus 2. So I'm going to do x plus 2 times x plus 2. 2 times 2, that's 4. 2 times x is 2x. Put a placeholder. x times 2, 2x. x times x, x squared. And then I take and I add them together. 4, 4x, x squared. And now put your plus signs. Boom, there it is. So I've got x squared plus 4x plus 4. Now that's just this. Oh, and by the way, I almost made a mistake. Don't forget that negative sign in front, that negative sign. Bring that down. This one, I'm just going to distribute. Not a problem. 4 times x and... 4 times 2. So when I do 4 times x, that gives me 4x. And 4 times 2, that gives me 8 plus 1. I'm going to take and flip the sign of everything here. They all become negative. Mm-hmm. Okay. So I have g of x plus 2. Let's flip that sign. That's equal to negative x squared minus 4x minus 4. And now I'm just going to bring everything else down. Plus 4x minus 8 plus 1. Now gather your like terms. Let's combine them. 
So I got negative x squared, and nothing else matches that. So let's rewrite g of x plus 2. So nothing else matches that. I'm done with that. I've got negative 4x and positive 4x. Those two match. And actually, those two totally cancel out. Boom, boom. Because one's negative, one's positive. They cancel out, they become zero, so it's like they don't even exist. And lastly, I got negative 4 minus 8. So it's going to be negative 12 plus 1. That's going to become negative 11. So g of x plus 2 becomes negative x squared minus 11. And that's it. I've cleansed the daemon. So let's move right along. Moving right along, right along, right along. Now you've got a piecewise defined function. That's the next thing we're going to be dealing with, a piecewise defined function. Now, a piecewise function is a... Frankenstein function. Okay, because what they do is, you know how Dr. Frankenstein, he dug up bodies and such like that, and then he, he took parts of bodies and he put them together? Well, that's what a piecewise function does, is it takes parts of functions and it puts them together. And it chops them off at these x values. In this case, it chops it off at zero. So this function, top one, is used when x is less than zero. This bottom function is used when x is greater than or equal to zero. So what we're going to do is when we evaluate a piecewise function, all we have to do is find out which one we plug into based on our x values. So for instance, let's take this one at x equals negative 1. So let's just write f of negative 1 because we're plugging in negative 1 for x. Now, do we plug it into the top or do we plug it into the bottom? And this tells us. So I'm plugging in negative 1. Negative 1 is less than 0. So I'm going to use the top function, x squared plus 1. I'm going to use the top one. Oops, didn't mean to do that. Top function. So I'm going to plug in negative 1 quantity squared plus 1. Negative 1 quantity squared is 1 plus 1, which is 2. So f of negative 1 equals 2. Now, I'm going to evaluate it for 0. Well, I use the top when x is less than 0. But when it's equal to 0, I'm going to use the bottom because it says use this one when x is greater than or equal to 0. So I'm going to plug in 0 right now. So f of 0 is equal to 0 minus 1, which is negative 1. So f of 0 equals negative 1. And lastly, I'm going to use 1. So I'll write f of 1. And which one are we going to use? Top or bottom? Well, in this case, we're going to use the bottom because 1 is greater than or equal to 0. So f of 1 is 1 minus 1, and that's 0. f of 1 equals 0. That's all you do. Just plug it in, plug it in. From S.C. Johnson, a family company. Now, what you guys are going to do in your Haiku Learning account, you're going to go to the, the page. And you are going to write out your own definition for a piecewise defined function. It's going to be in your own language. I will be giving you points for it. So write it out. Pause this video. Write it out. Go ahead. Write it. Write it. I mean it. Write it in your own words. Yep. Write it. You better pause the video. 
You didn't pause it, did you? We're going to want to pause it now because I'm going on to the next thing. Boom. I'm at the next one. So finding values for which f of x is equal to 0. You need to find the real values of x such that f of x is equal to 0. So when I'm saying f of x is equal to 0, what I'm saying is this whole thing equals 0. It's the same as if I say find the x values where y is equal to 0. By the way, remember, f of x is y, or y is f of x. It's the same thing. They represent exactly the same thing. I meant to erase there. I didn't erase, though. Okay? So that's y equals 0. I taught you in the previous section. If y equals 0, the point is called a, or an, x-intercept. So remember, x-intercept, y is equal to 0. For a y-intercept, x is equal to 0. So in this case, I'm looking for x-intercepts. So all I do is I plug in 0 for f of x. And that's equal to x squared minus 5x plus 6. I'm going to use the big F word in math, which is factor. And to do that, I'm going to use the magic X. Yes, it's the magic X. The way we do it is... Two numbers that multiply to give me 6 and add to give me negative 5. So these two numbers are negative 3 and negative 2. So I'm going to go back here and I'm going to say 0 equals x minus 3 quantity times quantity of x minus 2. And now I am going to separate it and set it equal to 0. And this is why I'm going to do it, is because this is multiplication right now that's happening between these. It's multiplication right here. That's multiplication. So what I'm saying is I've got some number times some number. And that's giving me the answer of 0. So... What we need to understand is the only way we're going to get an answer of 0 out of multiplying numbers is if this number is 0 or if this number is 0. Because 0 times a number is 0. So that's why what we're doing is we're going to separate them and set them both equal to 0. Because I'm going to find out what value makes this 0. So x minus 3 equals 0. What value makes x minus 3 equal to 0? I also want to know what value equal makes x minus 2 equal to 0. That's why we set them to 0, because it's really multiplication. I'm multiplying this binomial times this binomial. So for them, to, the multiplication to be 0, either this is 0 or this is 0. So x minus 3 equals 0 when x is negative 3. And x minus 2 is equal to 0 when x is, did I say negative 3? What am I thinking? Really? Negative 3? No, when x equals positive 3. And this is when x equals 2. Okay, so I've got that. So now I know x equals 3 and x equals 2. So finding all the revalues of x such that f of x is 0. So I know I have point 3 comma 0 and I have a point 2 comma 0. These are my x intercepts. Or another way of calling them is my roots. So next question. I need to find the value of f of x, or find the value of x, sorry, such that f of x is equal to g of x. I know that f of x is equal to x squared plus 1, and g of x is equal to 3x minus x squared. These two are the same. So I'm just going to write f of x equals g of x. And now I'm going to plug in x squared plus 1 for f of x. 
So I've got x squared plus 1. And I'm going to plug in 3x minus x squared for g of x. I've got them set equal to each other. Now, I'm going to need to get one side to be 0. So I'm either going to move all this junk over here, or I'm going to move all this junk over here. Now, I don't like having a negative x squared. So if I subtract x squared from both sides here and move this over here, I'm going to end up with a negative x squared. I don't like that. So what I'm actually going to do is move all this over here. So I'm going to add x squared from both, on both sides. So plus x squared. And I'm going to subtract 3x. Well, I don't have a match here, so I'm just going to do it on the outside, minus 3x. And when I do that, that's going to give me negative 3x, add it together, plus 2x squared, plus 1, and that's equal to 0. Now, why I put this 3x down here instead of up here, I have no idea. I don't understand it, but whatever. Let's just roll. I'm going to put this in descending order. So I'm going to make this into 2x squared. I'm just going to bring this out in front. Minus 3x plus 1. And that's equal to 0. And yes, the F word of math, which is factor. So to factor, I'm going to use the magic x. Mm-hmm. I need to find two numbers that multiply to give me now. When you have a trinomial and the leading coefficient of the trinomial is 2, what, or shall I say is any number aside from 1, what you're going to do is multiply them together. So I'm going to say 2 times 1. That's 2. goes in the top. And take the middle number, negative 3. That goes in the bottom. I'm also going to take this right here, and I'm going to show you why. I'm also going to take 2x, and I'm going to put it in the bottom here. 2x, 2x. Now, I need to find two numbers, and I'll show you why I put the 2x there. I need to put, find two numbers that multiply to give me positive 2 and add to give me negative 3. So those two numbers are negative 2 times negative 1 because negative 2 times negative 1 is positive 2 and negative 2 plus negative 1 is negative 3. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to keep my fraction, but I'm going to simplify. And I'll show you why I do this. So I can simplify this. The 2's cancel out, so it becomes negative 1 over, in this case, 1x or just x. And this one becomes, well, it stays the same. Perfectly fine. Negative 1 over 2x. Now, the reason I put the 2x here is, again, because the leading coefficient of my trinomial is not 1. It's a different number. Now, if it's 1, I don't have to do that. I can just do the normal magic x right here, what we're used to. But because it's a number other than 1, I'm doing this extra step because when I do this extra step, it gives me my binomials. In this case, my binomial is x minus 1. I just take the bottom, minus 1. I take the bottom, 2x, minus 1. So simplifying this out, it becomes here, x minus 1 times 2x minus 1, and that's equal to 0. Now, it's asking me to find the values of x, so I keep going. I'm going to split it up. So I'm going to say x minus 1 equals 0, 2x minus 1 equals 0, and I'm going to solve. In this case, x equals positive 1, and I'm going to skip steps here. No, I'm not. I want to, but I'm not. So add 1 to both sides. 
so I've got 2x equals 1, and now I'm going to divide by 2. So 2x equals 1, divide by 2, 2's cancel out, x equals 1 half. So I got x equals 1 and x equals 1 half. These are the two values that make f of x equal to g of x. And if we want, we can plug it in to test. Here, let's plug it in. f of 1. Well, that's 1 squared plus 1, which is 1 plus 1, which is 2. And let's take this one, g of 1. Well, that's 3 times 1 minus 1 squared. So that's 3 minus 1, which is 2. So that works out. It shows you. All right, so I'm just going to go to the next one. Oh, there is no next one. Well, there you go. Um, I can test this one half if I really want to, but honestly, I really don't want to. Um, but I'll do it anyway. So I'm going to erase this, though, because I'm running out of room. So, I just showed you that f of 1 and g of 1 are the same. And now I'm going to show you f of 1 half. So I plug it into here. 1 half quantity squared plus 1. So 1 half quantity squared, that's 1 fourth plus 1. So that's... 1 and a fourth. And let's do g of 1 half. So that's 3 times 1 half minus 1 half quantity squared. Ew, I'm evil. So 3 times 1 half, that's 1 and a half. Okay, because that becomes 3 over 2, which is 1 and a half. So I'm just going to write it as one and one half. And that's minus one half quantity squared. That's one fourth. One and a half minus one fourth. Well, that is equal to one and one fourth, which is exactly the same as that. Oh, my God. Okay, so there you are. I just showed you that at x equals 1, f of x and g of x are the same, and at x equals 1 half, f of x and g of x are the same. All right, you guys, so um, that's basically about it for this section. If you have any questions, you can always ask me. Please do your homework. Um, that's it. Nothing else. So have a great day. Peace.